Super. Um, Calvert, co-chair of the Action Collaborative on Business Engagement in Building Healthy Communities. Also on the call, in addition to our great speakers, Arlena Beku and Bob McClellan, who's a fellow co-chair. And uh, just for those on the call, thank you all for joining. Uh, the Action Collaborative is an ad hoc activity associated with the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement, which is itself a convening activity launched in 2013 by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. In the Collaborative, uh, we aim to be a flexible, action-oriented group that welcomes all interested organizations and individuals and really excited to see the just range of folks who are on the call today. Our purpose is to really try to catalyze and facilitate private sector partnerships and collaborative actions of business, health, community, and public sectors to work together to enhance the lives of workers and communities by improving the nation's health and wealth. This seminar is the third in our 2020 series and it's being shaped particularly by the public health crisis that we're all dealing with and a desire particularly to share across the nation great examples from around the country. To give you a heads up for our next webinar, it's also on a COVID-19 related topic. That's going to be, and you'll get announcements, June 18th at 4.30 p.m. And Alina will put the link in the chat for everyone. That webinar is titled Learning from the Michigan Health Improvement Alliance Response to COVID-19 and will feature Kathy Basie and her colleagues. We're in the process also of scheduling a fifth webinar in July that will focus on another multi-sector regional effort to respond to COVID-19. To set the stage for today, one of the things that we have found in the collaborative is that there's an even greater urgency and timeliness now around our mission to bring together stakeholders to learn how it is that businesses and other leaders are working together for very effective interventions to address health and economic well being. And as all of you on the phone have come to have the realization, is the pandemic has revealed very significant issues and fault lines that reveal the critical connections between chronic conditions, access, vulnerable populations, and their connectivity of health and economic resiliency, both for individuals and stakeholders, as well as for communities. And I think at the same time, you know, even with those issues and challenges, as this web webinar is going to show you, the pandemic has also revealed the incredible willingness of community leaders and almost every resident in communities to understand they have shared value and that they're putting the public good ahead of individual interest. And that's a really kind of remarkable place for us to be in and I think it yields a lot of opportunities. And you'll be excited, I think, to hear today about a collaborative of stakeholders that came together uh, in a brand new initiative in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, thanks to the leadership and creativity of our two speakers, Dr. Bill Saderwhite and Terry Williams of Lake Forest Baptist Health. You'll see their fuller bios on the next slide, but Bill is the Chief Health and Wellness Officer with great experience working with self-funded employers and businesses for solutions. Terry is the chief strategy officer for Wake Forest with a more than extensive portfolio, including business health solutions, collaboratives and population health. I'll turn it over to them with a, just a couple of me mechanics. Our goal here is for Bill and Terry to show you their incredible story and detail for the next 45 minutes. Uh, we encourage you in the interim, please do use the chat function for your comments, but particularly for your questions, because as they finish their presentation, we really want to leave substantial room between when they finish and 1.30 to have a Q&A session, which Bob's going to lead off for us. And we want to reserve 
that critical five minutes for Terry and Bill to wrap up with their final comment. With that, Bill, Terry, let me turn it over to you. Uh, we should all put our masks on now. Uh, welcome and, and eager to hear what you uh, want to share with us. Thank you very much. We're glad to be here. Yes, thank you. We, we hope today is a, a time of being able to share ideas of things that are working and, and what we've done to engage increasingly large numbers of people in a, a stressful time in communities all over the country and, and, and certainly around the world. In our time together today, we hope to walk through a handful of topics. First, we're going to discuss specifically some of the things that are on the minds of employers. Bill and I work with employers across the region and, and have seen the conversations change, um, in some cases dramatically, over the course of the last couple of months. We want to share some of what we're hearing and some of the, um, the uh, areas of emphasis that, that are moving forward as a result of that. Then we have two case examples that we think will bring this home and make it very practical. One is the Mass the City initiative, which is um, I hope you'll um, believe is or, and see is pretty phenomenal in terms of the scale and the number of people that came together in the matter of days to do something that uh, benefited hundreds of thousands of people. Then we'll have a case study a little bit, take a step back and a little bit bigger picture on what were some of the key catalytic elements that allowed spread and diffusion to occur quickly and effectively and in terms of what that meant in terms of the leadership style and the networks that were formed and, uh, and how it was positioned in the marketplace. And then we will talk, uh, cycle back to some of the things that we're seeing with employers and how employers play such a key catalytic role in unison in, in, the, in a case like this with not only political leaders, but other nonprofits and uh, churches, which we will use as, as an example. I think this time in the last couple of months has really given us an in-color view of what it means for people to come together for the benefit of all. And uh, that sort of perspective, not worrying about who gets the credit, but being very focused on a goal and multiple goals. We'll also talk about how the networks that have been set up, we think have created uh, a uh, momentum that is now being used in a number of other areas besides what you might think of as COVID response. And I think that has a, a big implications on large scale change and transformation that's important in communities. And it will continue to be important for the next few years as we are sort of digging out of a hole that's been created by COVID. <clears throat> and then we look forward to your questions at the end and some good dialogue through chat. So if we were to summarize on a single page, some of the, what we, you know, a curve of, of complexity and, and feelings that at some level we have all had, and I know today has really built a lot around uh, from an employer view as key business leaders and communities. We probably have gone through, and you might look on this curve yourself and, and try to identify where you are moving from original kind of shock and realization, like what just happened? What's happening with my company? What do you mean we, we can't actually be open? Or what do you mean we can only run at 10%? Uh, what, do you, what does it mean that no one can actually come in the store even though we're ready to be open? And, and then moving on to now many are looking at more in the center of this picture. What are some of the things we need to do to, to navigate the future, to create new protocols, to actually make promises to the community? as employers so that they feel comfortable calling, uh, coming in, many employers, and I believe that you've uh, got to do that if, if you uh, treat it simply as business as usual and what are you all, why is anybody worried? That probably is gonna um, result in erosion of business um, further or trust that might be harder to overcome in the longer term. Lots of conversations among employers and between employers and healthcare organizations around guidelines for what's happening inside their business and in waiting rooms and and social gatherings, a lot of, uh, and I'll share a little bit more on that. And then as we get a little closer, we start moving more and more to the right and getting very specific on, we actually are, I mean, a number of the employers we're working with will, employees will enter the office differently every day, or in many cases, never enter the office as a result of what's happened in the, um, in the last few months. So these are the kinds of uh, specific ideas and initiatives that are happening with companies that we see around the 
uh, <clears throat> country and in our region specifically. I'm sure you've seen some of the case examples and, and in fact, I've, some of the podcasts I was listening to in the last week talking about some of the imported ideas from other countries that were leading a couple of, uh, a month or two ahead of time, for example, but a lot of work around how to change cleaning schedules and, and um, I think a belief that you should actually clean in the presence of customers. Historically, you would not do that because it was in the way, but some cleaning in the presence of customers may actually show your diligence and that you care about this. Uh, occupying workstations at lower density, looking at workstation sizes. Many companies are now looking at mandatory face masks in the workplace. I know in our health system, it's required to wear face masks. The only reason we're not wearing them in this moment, even though we're on the grounds, is because we're in a separate conference room. But anytime you're mobile outside your personal space, you'd be expected to wear a face mask, for example. You're seeing that in the news and customers, some rebelling against that. But if you actually look at the data, the reason that you wear a mask is not simply about protecting yourself and making the decision on, am I willing to have the risk? It's actually the single most actionable thing you can do to reduce the risk to others. Uh, limited sharing in terms of assets, establishing etiquette around, you can read those items. Altering access points, even to the point of having uh, intentional ways to scan in when you come in so you know when individuals are moving in and out, changing screening protocols, uh, intentionality around st staggered work shifts, and uh, things like capital upgrades. So these are all things that are relevant. They're conversations we're having every day with a number of employers. But I also want to let you know, that's actually not what we're going to spend the most of the rest of the conversation on today. We think these larger case studies of how to mobilize hundreds and thousands of people at, because of an uncommon set of unity is really something that has some good applicability. So I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Bill Satterwhite, who you heard from just a minute ago. The, the other item that should be on his bio that wasn't on the front page is he's an inventor. So he has also um, been the inventor of, of software that's being used at scale in um, a, a number of states. And he is a, uh, an inventor of several things, including the masks some, that you'll talk about today. So with that, I want to tee up Bill to talk about the 29-day journey that started with a, uh, we sometimes talk about another back, uh, wacky Bill idea. Many of these wacky Bill ideas turn out to be brilliant ideas, and uh, but not all of them, but many of them are. And so with that, I want to hand it to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Satterwhite. Yeah, thank you, Terry. So what I want to do is take you on uh, a little walkthrough of the 29-day journey that we went on roughly from the last week of March till about um, almost the middle of April. And it is a story about partnerships that sprung up and just the community, the ingenuity, the innovation coming behind it and saying, wow, this might actually be possible. And, and so this is really how it started for me on the thought process. The first thought was, I think as a community, we're going to have to step in and solve our own problems. We thought there was going to be little help coming from Washington, D.C., and little help coming from our state capital because everyone's so overwhelmed. So if we're going to address the matters in front of us, it's going to be us, right? This may be like a sports team where you go, well, I'm the new coach. I don't like these players. Well, those are the players you got. You got to make the best of it. How are you going to win? And so that's the way we approached it. So what you'll see is uh, really on day minus one, I was uh, at my house and I thought there are not going to be enough masks for healthcare workers, for the population. There just aren't, and they're not going to come from anywhere. Demand is high. Supply chain is broken. If we're going to solve the issue, then we're going to have to figure it out ourselves. And as Terry mentioned, uh, masks are an important, helpful protector, whereas it, if everyone does it all at once, there's going to be good protection for people in the community. If it's random, it's okay, but it's way better if everyone does it all at once. And so I called up a number of the people that work on my team who are used to my crazy bill ideas, and I said, hey, I got an idea. I think I want you all to come in, bring all of your gear, your sewing equipment, your extra materials, your duct tape, whatever it is, bring it all in. We're going to set up in a conference room. And we are going to figure out how do we address issues around this face mask crisis. 
So here's a quick rundown of how quickly this went. And this is why I laid it out in this way. So day one, met with the mask team, and I said, look, we need a mask that provides good protection, that's very comfortable, that breathes well, and that you can wash and reuse. And, and I felt terrible for all of my colleagues who are wearing masks that are designed for single use. And they would say, Bill, here's my mask for the whole week. And I was like, that is just not right, y'all. That is not right. And we need to step into that. So day one, we laid out our objectives and said, we don't know how we're going to get there, but this is where we're going to go. By day five, we had a good working prototype. By the 10th day, we had connected with a company in our area called Renfro Corporation. They happened to be the largest domestic producer of socks in America. And they were trying to figure out also what to do with their business. People were not buying a lot of socks. And at the same time, they were interested in making masks. So people connected us down in what we call Innovation Quarter, which is a fascinating part of the city that's basically been rebuilt and rejuvenated. We occupy a lot of the former tobacco warehouses that were down here. And they have been re renovated and upgraded. And the space where we were working was actually called Bailey Power Plant. And that's where the power was generated to run all the equipment in the plant. And so Renfro had space here and we have space here. And we got together. And we said, we got to figure this out. And so by day 14, we had developed a pretty good prototype with the materials that they had and what they could do. And it was a fascinating process. I had to go to Mount Erie where their headquartered is and, and where they have a development shop and learn about knitting. And you know, the first mask that we created was a cut and sew mask. And they said, we don't cut and sew, we actually knit. So how can we take the key things and actually put it into a mask that we can make? The other thing that happened when I went there is I realized the scale at which they could produce masks. So they said, at a minimum, we can make 20, 250,000 a week. At a maximum, we can make a million a week. And I thought, wow, that is crazy. That's unbelievable. And I'm not manufacturing. This was like, you know, my first intro to manufacturing. And, and so from that moment, I immediately thought, wow, I bet if we could get everyone behind it, we could mask our whole city in a week with just the mask that Renfro can make. And so I pitched that to Renfro and said, hey, are you open to this? Could we, we buy them from you, but could, could we have your first batch? And they said, we're very open to that. So then I called up um, a good friend of mine who's also an influential business leader. And I said, hey, Don, I got an idea and I think it'll work. I think we should try to mask the whole city in a 10 day period and wear them all everywhere we go in public. And that'll impact the trajectory of COVID-19 in our community and probably then impact our community as a whole, even in the economic realm. And so Don said, hey, I'm on it. This sounds great. And he began to call folks, line up city leaders, the health system leaders, the business leaders, the mayor, the nonprofits, the chamber. I mean, every day he was calling me saying, hey, they're on board, they're on board, they're on board. And we ended up with, I think, over 180 companies that in some way signed up to say, we are gonna buy masks for our employees and their families. And we're gonna try to mask the city. At the same time as the nonprofits rolled into it, they began to really be a lot of the organizational fabric for how we were gonna distribute these. And uh, it's an amazing story that I'm gonna let Terry tell you more about that particular piece. But by day 21, we clearly had all of these people on board to buy masks, and we had already begun fundraising from companies and individuals to buy masks that were gonna then be used for people that were gonna be below the poverty line and not able to get them themselves. Yeah, I think it's a, valuable to talk about two things quickly here is that I think a couple of key factors were, one, this had a timeline of urgency. So there was a date set of, what, of a press conference that was gonna occur led by the mayor less than 10 days out, and we need to know, are you on board or not? That's an important thing for driving change. And another was that they were asked at, this, at that moment to make a commitment not only for themselves, which frankly, that's easier to do in life than for others, but to make a commitment for all their employees and to give extra money to buy masks for the needy in our community. That was, a, that was the kind of the bundled ask. So that, that forced people to start thinking with a bigger vision than just themselves, but also get the vision for, hey, this may be a key foundational element to being able to stand up business and not have 
second or third waves or frankly a prolonged first wave of COVID. So our goal in part was to say, how do we decrease community spread? And we said, if we think if we all wear a mask, that will happen. Our initial target was not healthcare folks, although that did allow sort of preservation of masks for healthcare that are the more official approved masks for that context. So by day 29, we actually held a press conference with city leaders, healthcare leaders, the mayor, a few of us other folks, and said, this is what we're going to do. Our goal is to mask the city over the next 10 days and to all agree to wear our masks in public for at least 40 days in a row, wherever you go, the store, outside, any public space, or anytime you feel like you can't achieve social distancing in a certain context. I think there's another good change lesson here. There was a specific amount of time designated, not unlike um, in if somebody were to take on a diet and you were to say, hey, are you willing to be on a diet for the rest of your life? Now is the time to decide. Very few people will sign up for a diet for the rest of their life. But if you said, are you willing to be on a 40-day diet or are you willing to wear a mask for 40 days, that's a, a time of commitment that allows people to make that commitment and, and get others on board with the period of time. Of course, we can go longer than 40 days, but that's enough time to get foundational improvement and, frankly, to see if the data and the evidence is showing that we're making a difference in our community. And it's hard to wear a mask. I don't know how many of you have done it very long. Masks are hot, they're stuffy, they're uncomfortable, they fog your glasses, all that. So we tried to design something that would minimize the things that we felt were negative about masks. And you can see the picture of the mask there on the right. We intentionally created a real out pouch there that we called a breathing pocket for more air exchange and to keep it away from your mouth. And uh, a la uh, they're not elastic. They're actually kind of a nylon cord tie around the head to be snugger fit. But at ear loops, ear loops are very uh, uncomfortable after a while and one size does not fit all. And people's faces and head shapes and hair are very different. So that impacts, you know, how a mask fits. Uh, this became actually the logo, which is available for anyone to use, Mass the City, and we put Winston-Salem, you know, beneath it with what we were doing, and that was, in essence, our tagline. The idea was wear a mask, love your neighbor, protect yourself, stop COVID-19. So there's a sense of how, uh, by doing this, you are actually caring for others around you, right? This is not just about me. It's actually about you. I'm doing this for you right, because a lot of people with COVID-19 don't know they have it. And so we just felt like this, this was a way, a way to do that. Now, here's another picture on, of the mask and also gives you some insight into how much happened. And so within about a 10-day period, 390,000 masks were distributed. It was stunning, actually. And our population is 250, 250,000, give or take, but a lot of people come from, you know, the communities around, et cetera. And, and we just felt like everybody needs a mask. Our goal was everybody needs a mask, right? And we uh, ended up passing out 75,000 masks for free to folks in contexts where we felt like uh, they needed it and it was gonna be hard for them to get. You see there that we raised $180,000, which then went to buy masks. Uh, and, uh, and Terry's going to pick this theme up, but 189 volunteer organizations distributed all the masks. It, it, it was stunning. It was like an army of ants that was organized for people to say, hey, my organization knows where those people live. My organization can take it to here. We have contacts with those folks. It, it was amazing, actually. I mean, it was stunning. It, it, was, it was the most incredible thing I think I have ever seen. And then I'll show you one more slide before I turn it over to Terry. We did do our own internal testing on the material itself. Part of our desire was to say, how can we have a mask that, that we know something about? You know, there are all kinds of materials out there. There are different groups doing their homemade masks, you know, of cotton or batik or something else. And uh, there are various ear loop masks, surgical masks, all that out there. And so part of our own institution, um, part of our uh, – innovation team that does a lot of um, organ regeneration and growth, actually. It's a fascinating. They had equipment that said, hey, we can do particle testing. We can at least find out, you know, how good is this fabric at stopping things that come. Now, I have to give the appropriate FDA disclaimer. 
This is not approved testing. They're not an accredited lab. This was purely set up for us to have some sense of relative um, capabilities of different materials. So we actually tested over 60 materials through the course of about a week or two. Some of that was uh, related to Renfro. Some was just a broader field of it because masks were coming at us from everywhere. And we said we at least need to know what the context is for it in terms of the material and then what's the right context for where. And so it was clear to us that it was going to be a community context, not a medical device. So you just need to understand that. But for us, it was helpful to say, you know, where do we feel like the relative value of this mask is? You know, am I going to put it on my 85-year-old mother or am I going to feel like uh, it's not, not good enough? And so it was a very helpful process to step through. And I think the Renfro Corporation is now doing more testing. There's official testing, ASTM, et cetera, that they are pursuing. Um, but that was a helpful framing exercise for us. And, and, and I think part of that was we knew that cotton masks, which are, are most typically used by people that are putting together masks, rarely have a weave that is good enough to catch one micron particles, virus sized particles. So we, we really wanted to make sure we were using, if we knew there were fabrics that were inadequate, that we were not using those and um, wanted to use antimicrobial fabric where we could and, and those kinds of things. So the other thing I'll point out is, and so as you look at the cotton mask, it's highly varied. And I think part of the reason this hadn't become more of a story around the country is because probably a mask is better than no mask, uh, e even with you know, poor material. But in the case of where we were gonna be handing these to people in communities, including the elderly and including people that were high risk, we wanted to know that we had done our homework to uh, at a one on the one micron particle, so that we could feel good about um, you know what was what was being used. Yeah, and so this graph is actually showing you know the length of the bar is really the range of, of uh, uh, particle filtration efficiency in the test that they did. They ran each thing six minutes for two and a half minutes to say where does it go, and you see it's a pretty wide range. Um, you know, you may happen to have. The mask, which for some reason is filtering well or not. You're talking cotton right now, not yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, we just wanted a glimpse of that, um, but again, not an FDA mask, not for medical use, et cetera. Terry, why don't you pick it up from here and talk about what's happened since? So hopefully, you get this vision of everyone coming together, everyone saying, "This is what we need to do. This is the right thing. It's a good thing. It's good for all of us. Everybody's in." everybody's in. So I think I have four or five slides to talk about some of the other story that's a part of this 29-day story. And it involves a group of nonprofits, companies, and churches that have been spending increasing time together over the course of the last several years. And uh, one of the, the lead groups in the center of that is a group called Love Out Loud. Love Out Loud started several years ago, and their mission is to catalyze and enable and empower groups to come together and to make a difference in their communities. It's both the faith community and the non-faith community coming together in powerful ways. And so some of the, I think the generalized adoption and spread um, elements that are so key here, one is that relationships are so key. If you have good relationships, change will move faster. Trust needs to be in place. We Early on, this had influential community leaders that all committed probably within three days of each other. So we had the mayor, head of the chamber, several influential business leaders that all committed very rapidly. And then that could be used to get others to um, say, okay, well, if they're committed, then it's probably good for us to commit. And then uh, there was from the beginning, uh, one of those initial calls was from Don, uh, Bill, the colleague that Bill mentioned reached out to Love Out Loud and said, hey, we think this mass project is going to come together. Can you mobilize the, uh, the community to make it happen? Specifically related to the mass the, the mass the City initiative, the cause was key. You saw in the wording that Bill mentioned a minute ago, you know, protect yourself, love your neighbor. Those were key elements that we wanted people to begin to own and care for their neighbor. This is actually a really important thing in a pandemic and in life. There are a lot of people that during this time have gotten fearful and are hibernating and might not actually want to come out of their house. And as we mentioned a minute ago, we had 189 organizations that helped deliver masks. 
that's pretty phenomenal. So while we're telling people to shelter, we also said we will provide you a mask. We did our own homework on how to let those organizations engage safely. I know Love Out Loud spent a week actually working with healthcare leaders, uh, contacting us at Wake Forest Baptist and others around the community to say what could be a, a platform of safe interaction that we could use. So in other words, they weren't going in people's houses to hand, hand out masks and they had uh, thought through how they would be gloved and protected. And then uh, the, another key element in this, the, the two largest healthcare organizations in the community, in our case, Wake Forest Baptist Health and Novant, both sets of leaders committed to, to be behind this. And that was key because we were basically setting out a, a direction for the community that if you know it didn't work well, it was ultimately gonna come back to the healthcare systems to, to uh, be a backstop on this. And we said, no, we, they, we think it's a good thing. And what you see in the Venn diagram there is Love Out Loud had a lot of relationships kind of as represented in that big circle. This initiative pulled in some additional nonprofits and churches to help in delivery and as well as some additional employers. They were pretty um, thoughtful in how they divided up the city. So while this was not a master plan that had been worked on for months, it actually came together in a few days they did look at what zip codes, what neighborhoods was, were going to be covered, and how would they be covered, and then look for who could get to certain parts of the city and take responsibility for that. So they were they were rigorous on thinking through how to make this happen. So this this group love out loud because it's so unique. I know there are uh, I know of a couple other examples in the country and uh, that are that uh, like this, but it's somewhat unique, and that is so it's been around for. For several years, it is kind of a catalyst and convener. Many of the things they do, they don't even put their name on their job. They're trying to equip others to pursue their passion and mission. You can get a feel there for the, the size of the, the number of entities that are that are coming together. I mentioned a minute ago that a lot of work was done for how are we going to do this and do it safely. And there, there are some examples of some other programs, like they have a Christmas for the City program where 15,000 people come together every December and so they they are used to thinking at scale and how to bring people together and their other big mission is to think about how do i move volunteers from i want to help which many people have that thought to how do i actually get engaged if i had a saturday to be engaged or if i wanted to commit a couple of evenings a month and so they're they're masterful at making that happen and i'll share a, 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 a some of the techniques on how they do that so they use a couple of ways. One is something called pathways. That's an active coaching process. So when people come and say, hey, I, I want to be a part of this community in a bigger way, then they can actually do an assessment and go on something that we call the base technology. That's actually how um, many um, organizations around the community now use base um, over 100 to engage their uh, the volunteers and get them plugged in at specific times and it matches to match the passion of, of the individuals. They have a very intentional process. It's all relationally driven. So there's people talking to people, even though there's technology involved, this is not at all about technology replacing people and relationships. And uh, so they, they work to have it uh, well-grounded relationally, uh, spiritually, when there are those that are, that are receptive to that and, uh, and technologically. And that, brings that's what brings the community together and in, uh, in some amazing ways and just another example of so the uh, as on the base technology that i mentioned so about 190 nonprofits use it and you can see over on the right a number of programs in the last you know year or two that they have done that brings together a number of volunteers in a, in a high variety you know everything from shoe distribution through uniform exchanges in schools for the in title one schools through uh, disaster relief effort or and et cetera. So when that this group then sort of said, okay, we will help be a catalytic agent as a part of Mass for the City, even before Mass for the City, they had stood up and and even today are delivering over 10,000 meals a week are going to distressed parts of the city or for people that are out of work. That's a pretty phenomenal story and the way that's happening, the groups that come together to cook, there's a rhythm every day where the, the meals going people come to central points to get the meals another initiative related to meals love out loud used some or so originally a little bit of some of their funds to actually pay restaurants to make meals so that they could actually have some income during this time and then um, 
um, that we've had additional foundational funding that was then uh, funneled in so that restaurants have been and employers have been having business and that their capability to make meals at scale was actually benefiting people that were hungry. So another good example of connecting the dots. And the last thing I'll say on this is this network is, is so proven now that there are discussions going on. How will we use this network to improve um, education reach into parts of the community over the summertime because we know we can target right down to the individual houses and neighborhoods where there's needs, where there are kids of certain ages. And so I think this idea of building a network and then using the network, allowing people to operate in their area of passion and, and desire is very powerful and then doing it in a way that's tailored to their level of commitment. So that's, a, that's the part of the 75 day story that I wanted to share is it started with meals being stood up immediately and uh, I think it's 1,800 meals a day are still being delivered and will for the foreseeable future. So Love Out Loud, Chuck, Chuck Spong is the director of Love Out Loud, uh, amazing individual who just really does, is in this for all the right reasons to love on people and, and care for them. And I asked him, I told him I was doing this today and I said, what do you think has been key? And he said, you know, I haven't even had a chance to think about it. We've been in the middle of a whirlwind for weeks, but let me uh, carve off a few minutes and write down. And so these were the things that he said he believed were key for why this has worked. And number one, that relationship and, tr and trust are the big, uh, must precede this idea for partnership. That's foundational work. We all have got to come together and use our own unique assets. So when in Master City, some people said, we'll be drivers. Some people said, I know that community. We have multiple languages spoken. We have refugees. We had people that we need to say, who, who can engage with that group, for example. Um, a lot of the time was actually um, about deepening relationships. So they never were they saying, hey, we're just going to go uh, throw out or hand out masks. It was always about looking more deeply, figuring out, are there other ways that we can encourage or support you in this time? Also, um, that it would be very easy for something like this. Anything that's very transactional has the opportunity to get off track if it's done just focused on a transaction and not focused more relationally. And then um, lots of intentionality to let the grassroots organizations take the, the lead. I think, in fact, if uh, Chuck were on this right now, he would, all, he would spend all his energy talking about the other organizations. It's never about the central organization or a coordinating organization. It's about allowing others to step into their passion. They were completely, you know, the organizations really came out of the woodwork to say, we want to do this for our community. And, and, and continue to. And we also, I, I would say on the slides, we have kind of shortened conversations about, uh, you know, any kind of faith-based institution into the word churches. It was much broader than that. We've shortened uh, all of the different types of organizations that don't have uh, revenue generation as their primary funds to nonprofits for, for the slide. But it was way broader than just the bullet points that we have put on there from an organizational standpoint. Just wanted to throw that out there. That's a great point, thank you. And then um, really working to um, build on and, and, and extend the, uh, the encouragement as you go, uh, focusing and just hum humbly moving forward and, and practicing servant leadership around every corner. There's really, this was not viewed as there's a single leader or organization or institution. I'm, I'm using Chuck here because he is the director of Love Out Loud, but he would be the first to say this was like amoeba-like in terms of how it's happening. There wasn't a master plan. And I think that's an important lesson for many of us who are in employers I, in my own role. I'm, I'm expected to drive change, make things happen in an organized way, but some of the most amazing change in life is not completely organized. It's a little messy and we need to be okay with that messiness. And, yeah, and it, it was kind of funny because people, like the day after we announced, people would uh, first email me and ask me if I had masks, like in my car or something to give them. And I'd be like, no, actually I don't make them. And, uh, and then at the same time, people um, initially after the press conference, you know, thought like I was in charge and I would say, actually, I'm not in charge. I just kind of like, you know, threw out the idea and said, here, let's go for it. And they say, well, who's in charge? I'd be like, uh, well, you know, we got some people who are kind of doing this and there's some people doing that and so-and-so is trying to, you know, corral that group. And, you know, well, who? I was like, that's kind of how it's working. Right. And so we can put you in 
touch with multiple different leaders that are doing multiple different things, you know, all together. But but there's not a there's like no one in charge. Right? Well, yeah, no single individual. No single person. Multiple, yeah, yeah, that's true. There were multiple people that were leading, but no yeah. single individual. But I yeah. think the other generalized lesson, I don't know how much uh, reading you may have done on the idea of complexity theory, but complexity, navigating complexity and waiting for answers to emerge in the right timing is different than navigating a complicated situation. Complex environments as this was, you actually can't make all the decisions on the first day. The, the need, the ability to make decisions unfolds, and that is one of the truisms of, of managing complexity. And so this was, a, um, was one of those situations, and I think it was appropriately, if we had taken time to try to stand up a, a, a massive hierarchy and what are all the decisions we need to know, we would have lost the speed that was needed and frankly, we wouldn't have been able to do it because you learn some of the decisions that need to be made as you take the next uh, step in stepping out. And then finally, uh, Chuck's last point that he would around timing and luck, or as he would say, the activity of God in the community. But being in the right place at the right time is it was key, he believes, and and having willing people able to step forward and frankly not be so concerned about themselves, be concerned about others. And whenever there was a hole or a neighborhood got skipped or so-and-so ran out of, you know, mass for this group or that group, you know, on Tuesday, then we say, okay, let's, let's circle up. Let's figure out how we're going to address that issue. You know, is it because we didn't deliver? Is it because there weren't funds to buy them? We need to find the funds. I mean, people would just react and respond and go to it. And, and we knew at the beginning with the speed it had come together with the volunteer nature of it, that there were going to be uh, holes and stuff dropped and stuff missed. And we just had to say, everybody's got to be okay with that. You know, it's coming from a good place. We'll fix it. We'll figure it out, but we're going to go. We're not going to wait till everything's perfect. And, and so we took off and, and have continued to say, Oh, there's a hole. There were these seniors that didn't get anything because they're not in a retirement center. They're not working. They're not in these neighborhoods. Okay. We need a plan to get masks to these seniors. What's our plan? And that's what everyone would do. It was amazing. And that's a great example. Uh, a few days into this, then a date was designated when 10,000 masks were set aside for seniors across the community. Ten locations were set up. In fact, if you went to MassTheCity.com, you could actually see the map is still posted. And the seniors could, on their own, decide to go drive into the parking lot. They would be handed uh, masks. Uh, so that they could have and take back to where they were. So we knew even though we had been rigorous and tried to get the mass out, there still could be gaps, and we wanted to make sure the most needy were at the front of the line. And, uh, and, and, and But you're right, at the beginning, we didn't know that. That idea wasn't yet clear. It was only identified after we were, got into it. And I am going to jump in, and I keep putting Terry off on this, but this is a really good slide where he's going to make a really good point. But <laughs> someone popped up a question. I happened to catch it on the messiness, how healthcare doesn't like messiness. How did you get healthcare leaders to deal with that? You're right. Healthcare likes to stay kind of like a train on these defined tracks. Don't get off the tracks, you know. And I'll tell you how we did it. Healthcare did not lead this, actually. Healthcare did not leave this. Well, let me healthcare came along on the journey, and and healthcare led it from a sense of saying this is a good thing to do, and as a large employer, we're going to buy a mask and we're all in. But it wasn't a uh, you know, who's the CEO of this system and this system? Wait, they're out in front. Uh, I I might need to provide a little <laughs> bit more backstory on this. <laughs> so as a direct report to the CEO of our health system, this absolutely was a conversation that came up. And that I yeah. was a part of, yeah. which was, hey, if we hand out the masks, is it possible people will uh, start ignoring um, the requirements of the mayor or requirements of the governor and just start leaving their houses um, and that we will actually lose control because we've given a false sense of security? So we had very thoughtful conversations. I probably put some of my credibility on the line as well as Bill's and said, we will we can't promise, but we can tell you how this is being positioned, and, and we will work with the leaders that are doing it to not uh, get a story going on, hey, get your mask, and everybody is good to go. Um, ignore all the guidance a week from now. We made sure that story was not going to get traction to the, the extent we possibly could, and, I, and the mayor was brought into this. So I, I, I would say, yeah, we, there were very thoughtful conversations at, in the healthcare organizations yeah. 
wanting to make sure that we, they weren't about to endorse something that had great intent, but actually might whiplash mm -hmm. on the community. I think it's played out very, very well yep. because all parties now were aware of this sensitivity. And everyone stayed with that. The community didn't, you know, suddenly hit all the bars or something and, you know, go hog wild with that. Um, and I think a key to that is the messaging in this was about think about your neighbor. Yeah. And you'll see in the news, even the last week, I won't name the retailer, but one of the retailers that had, you probably saw the headlines, you know, ask a customer to leave because they weren't wearing a mask and they were insulted. I mean, I, and they said, I thought this was a free country. Well, the reason you wear a mask is not for yourself when you go in and, uh, and because you actually can receive a virus through your eyes, nose or mouth. So if you're wearing a mask, you're not completely protected from receiving the virus. When you wear a mask, you are now being reduced in your ability to transfer to someone else. And so part of the, I think a really big key to this is a strong message about care about your neighbor as you do this. And I hope, I think that made a lot of people not think as selfishly as they sometimes do when stressed in something like a pandemic. Okay, I think we've got three slides left and uh, so we're gonna wrap up fairly quickly. So we, we gave all that background on how, you know, thousands of people were mobilized and 390,000 masks were amazingly distributed across the community uh, in a short period of time. Let's tie this back now on the employer side and employers were key to this. If employers had not stepped up and been leaders, if employers had not given money both for their own employees as well as to benefit others, wouldn't happen. We as employers now are looking at, and we're you know, asking ourselves, what's the shape of the curve on the economy? And you hear about the U-shape. I'm using a, a graph from the Hutchins Center at, at Brookings for this, or, or the more optimistic V-shape or even the Z-shape. Probably employers are hoping it's a Z-shape to recapture some of the lost uh, volume. But I think regardless of which it is, there are some truisms of things we need to do to be supportive of getting uh, ready for and helping catalyze uh, what's next. So what are some of those uh, thoughts in this uh, new brave world for employers? So one, there's a lot more thinking about how to ramp up business uh, and do it wisely, just opening the doors and not doing the preparatory steps, several of which we named in the first five minutes of this presentation uh, could really have a, a backlash. Second, I do want to call out that most that have their head in this space and are, um, you know, medically oriented are saying there will be and already is a second epidemic around mental health. Uh, the stress that's on people's families, uh, not just from the the actual uh, the disease, which actually causes stress by those directly and indirectly affected, but from being out of work and, and not able to actually advance one's uh, self and provide for oneself uh, mental health for college students and graduates who thought they were going to graduate and get a job and even have a graduation. There's a lot of ripple effect on that and we should, with eyes wide open, uh, recognize that. And I'm, I'm pointing this out because employers need to really destigmatize mental health conversation and go the extra mile to provide access to those services, talk about it in, in your workplace and encourage people to reach out. Of course, they don't need to reach out to the employer, they need to reach out to a separate independent service that they have set up for confidential engagement. Third, um, there are delays in individuals that should be seeking care and that will, that will lead to health issues and increased costs. So if people are hypertensive or they're diabetic and they uh, go out of control and they don't seek care, they could have pretty severe health, con and I'm aware of some of those things happening in communities around the country. So we shouldn't just think that this is just kind of pushing back um, some care. It, it really is. We need to encourage our employees to get appropriate care. Um, this uh, accountability around employees and their health status when they show up for work, needing to attest to the fact that they are feeling well and should be ready. And then some employers are really getting more rigorous about the need to understand location and movement and where you might have been. And there's conversations I know in some employers around should they be tracking when people change floors so that they know who they might have been in contact with if they come down with COVID two days later and could say, okay, we know they were on the first and third floor and we can do contract tracing more precisely. So the point is the number of unique conversations are coming up um, around the country. For healthcare partners, and Bill really, uh, Dr. Satterwhite, uh, is having many of these conversations directly with employers, 
but they are articulating a need for ongoing expertise around infectious disease. What does it mean for how I should be, what I should be doing as an employer? They don't want to take on a liability risk from doing something wrong, but they also know if they keep the door shut, they're, they're in trouble or they feel they are. Uh, second, I want to make a comment on testing platforms. They're not all the same, and, I, and there are several, and I'm not going to name them, but that they are really not reliable when the FDA lowered the bar some weeks ago to allow tests to, to get out quicker. It was all well intended, but you had a number of companies that um, brought tests forward at that time that now have been proven to not, they weren't standardized, they, they were not predictable. Still some major companies are uh, wrestling with the, um, um, you know, the specificity with which the, the virus is being and they have, so they have false positives and negatives. So we, we know we're being asked for advice on that. And uh, we want people to know that they're not all reliable and over-testing can be a problem. If you go test a bunch of people that you shouldn't have tested, you could have a lot of false positives. And uh, then you, what do you do with that? It's a mess. It, it really would be a mess. And then uh, we are in conversations around having surveillance platforms that allow individuals to be um, uh, monitored as they show up for work um, or you know, as they enter the building, for example, and then finally, I think this topic around certification is a really interesting one. And I think you will see locally and maybe at state levels, um, entities starting to define a standard, uh, you know, that, that may align with the phases for opening. Otherwise, everyone's kind of doing their own standard and, and consumers are going to be feeling stuck. I'm not really sure how to differentiate this place versus this place and who's going the extra mile uh, if we were to set foot in that door. So I think you'll start seeing more around that kind of that kind of thought. So I, I hope this was uh, helpful. To, I hope you saw both some specific lessons and maybe inspirational ideas on engagement, but also some generalized concepts that would be helpful in your community or employer space. I think those are a couple of the topics that Bill and I would m most love to learn from you on is what are you doing that's engaging your community and, and, and employers at scale uh, successfully and, and then at the employer level, what are specific ideas you're finding that you think are uh, effective and, and so we look forward to that kind of dialogue as well. Thank you very much, Terry and Bill, and uh, we'll hope to get um, our masks coming to us from you soon. Uh, but to start the conversation and the Q&A, there obviously are a significant number of questions on the chat. Thank you very much. I want to turn it over to one of the two other co-chairs on the call, to Bob McClellan, to kind of start us off with a couple of uh, questions to Bill and Terry, and then I'll follow up with the ones that are on the chat room. I think, Bob, you need to unmute. I think he's saying he cannot unmute, that he may need, uh, maybe centrally somebody needs to unmute him. Okay, now we're good to go. Okay. Great, uh, thank you for that um, amazing and inspiring story. Uh, you know, Meg began in talking about the pandemic as how it has really um, brought a spotlight to the fault lines in our society with, in a number of respects with respect to, uh, and certainly in terms of health equity issues. Um, so along those lines, I have a couple of questions, uh, one kind of broader than the other, um, but on a, on a more narrow basis, some of these fault lines are cultural, social, racial, political. Uh, you mentioned that disunity is kind of one of the worst uh, enemies, if you will, in terms of trying to accomplish a public health uh, benefit, community health benefit. Um, uh, and you, you're, you did a lot to talk about how uh, even in preparation, there was a lot of uni unifying activities going on in the community. But I, I wonder if you could address a couple of things specifically. Uh, there is mention in the press across the nation about uh, people of color um, being profiled as potential um, uh, criminals because they were entering stores with masks on and they were fearful of wearing masks. Um, I wonder if you could address that issue and, and as we know there's been a political division also 
around mask wearing, not wearing masks, how those issues played out in your community. And I'm sure there were some episodes, how, how they may have been dealt with. And then maybe more expansively, is it too early or uh, maybe can you speak to whether or not you've identified um, untoward burden on um, the peoples of color and lower socioeconomic uh, other vulnerabilities uh, in your community? You want to uh, I'll, I'll let's say a couple things on that. So <clears throat> if you actually look at the data of who's affected, there is the disproportionate impact in many communities across the country and and if you look in places like uh and meat processing plants of which we have some in our area uh, if covid uh, moves into those environments it seems like they can move quite quickly because of you know the close proximity and whatever set of standards that they were using prior to covid we one of the things that was done early on in the original first few phone calls was to reach out across ethnic lines. And in fact, on one of the uh, pages about Love Out Loud, it said the minister's conference, which is an African-American led minister's conference in Winston-Salem. And I think one of the first calls that was made was to that group to say, here's what we would like to do. Would you, do you support this? Is there something we should know about this that, and, and, and it wasn't a unique call to them. It was multiple groups, but they were one of the first calls. Yeah. Uh, in the Hispanic community, the same. And so in inviting their point of view into the conversation to see if that would alter in any way how we proceeded, I know that was an intentional step. Um, so those are the couple of points I wanted to make. Bill. Yeah, the other thing I would add is, um, is I think um, there has been a good history within the last five to seven years of a lot of trust creation in many, many ways. So our own organization has a whole department called Faith Health that is uh, broad, generic faith health, reaching out to any type of people in, in community settings and, and helping to determine what are the uh, real nodes of strength and power in every community, because virtually every community have, has them. One of our colleagues, Gary Gunderson, once wrote a book called The Leading Causes of Life, and he said, you know, healthcare, all we do is talk about leading causes of death. I think I'm going to talk about the leading causes of life. And so he wrote a book on that. And, and that's that idea of where are the places. So we, and, and that group particularly has what they call community connectors and others. So there's this whole fabric going out that exists in our community that, um, that really is clearly there in ways that we saw with Mass the City. And so one of the things that I would say is, uh, I, I can't say my own personal experience about it, but my observation is if you were going to select a group of people based on the color of their skin as to who wears the mask most often in public, it's actually the people of African-American descent here in our community. And, and I don't know the origin of that, but I know that that is extraordinarily strong. And, and so this kind of dovetailed right in with that movement, which I think was somehow already there. And, and so we have not had that same sort of uh, concern in terms of mistrust or, or that happening around wearing a mask. I will say sometimes I think about that for myself because since I have no hair and I'm very, used to be blonde, I've had lots of skin cancer things up here. So I now wear a hat, often a cowboy hat. And I thought about that. When I go into the store with my cowboy hat on and my sunglasses and my mask, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just walked right out of a, you know, a stick em up movie of some kind. Mm. But that's now becoming the norm here. And part of being able to do it all at once as a big movement is the goal was to say, how do we normalize that? Mm. Right? So that's our expectation. And, and while it's not perfect, it's happened in a tremendously huge way. So now if you go to most grocery stores in Winston-Salem, if you don't wear a mask, you actually stand out. People are like, oh, why are they not doing that, right? And so it's, it's, it's become normalized, which was part of our desire from the beginning. Yeah, I think that was, is part of the power. This was turned into a desire for a movement from the beginning. It wasn't, hey, let's, let's go target this part, this, these businesses or this segment of the population. It, it really was a movement for all. Mm -hmm. That's great. Let me, let me just ask one other question that's a little bit uh, pickier, if you will, but one that as an <laughs> occupational medicine physician, uh, I deal with all the time. 
and you can walk around communities and seeing people doing exactly the wrong thing with a mask. That is, a mask can be help break the chain of transmission. It could also contribute if it's you know used in a wrong way. And so I wonder about the issue of doffing and donning masks, reuse of masks, you know, uh, putting it on backward, you know, all of those issues that relate to the proper use of, uh, a, you know, a, a mask. Yeah, so one of the ways we address that is um, within the, the bag, the plastic bag that every mask came in, were instructions that related to that. And then we had the people handing them out, telling people what to do. And, uh, and then we have various opportunities for people to watch videos and other things that they feel like they need that. So in the worksite setting, we do a lot of that. And the goal is simply to try and say, okay, how do we maximize proper wear, minimize improper wear? Because a lot of people will walk around like with their nose out, you know, and you're like, well, uh, that is helpful, but you know, we got to, we got to get to a better state. Well, there was, but there's another story in this. It's one of these spontaneous navigating complexity stories. So actually, Bill's team had designed a how do you wear a mask flyer for an employer. And they genericized oh, yeah. it and they managed to get, uh, we then, uh, Wake Forest Baptist printed 15,000 copies of that. And that went out with the masks. We also, there was somebody in the his, uh, Hispanic community that said, I will translate that into Spanish. It was translated in uh, an afternoon and another version was also made so that these additional efforts to support this, the other thing we didn't say much here, the mask, one of the other reasons for this fabric, it was tested and we knew it could be washed at least 25 times without degradation because it was done. And, and, and so we told people really you should be washing the mask you know, each day. Now we realize not everyone will do that. And we, you know, we've also talked to people about, but there was a, there was an effort really to teach this. It's an excellent point you're making. It's not just throw on the mask and not think about how you're doing. In fact, adjusting the mask could actually be one of the, you know, most difficult things. That's also why the ties are completely adjustable and they're not elastic because you can't get the right tension on elastic depending on how you're, uh, you know, the shape of your head. So they can tighten it once and hopefully not have to keep messing with it. But, but one of the larger points, Bob, is that we are now asking employers and people in the community to suddenly act as if they are healthcare people, mm -hmm. right? So, so if I'm a business owner now, I'm not being asked just to clean in my regular way. I'm asked to clean like I were a hospital. And I don't know how to do that, actually. And I'm asked to dress as if I were a healthcare person. And I'm asked to wash my hands as if I somehow worked in a hospital. And that's hard. People are like, I have no idea what to do. Like, mm -hmm. what do we clean with? How often? What does it matter? I mean, you know, and, and then in a context where often equipment like masks are in short supply, so people are just doing whatever they can do. And in fact, I picked up coffee from a place today and uh, there was a gentleman, you know, my age with a big beard wearing a mask. And I kind of teased him. I said, I think you got the child size mask. Because it was this very <laughs> tiny homemade thing that he had to pick. Do I cover my nose or my mouth? And, and uh, you know, it was like, well, I think I can do better than that, right? And because that's all he had. It's a great question, though. That's great. Well, I think I'm going to turn it over to Meg. But I, let me encourage you guys, if you feel comfortable, um, and anyone on this call, and I know I have something that from our professional organization that we've designed for employers with these kind of instructions around uh, how to use a mask, what type to use, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be great if people could share that in the chat box and we'd figure out how to, how to post those afterwards. But I'll turn it back over to you, Meg, uh, to... Great, Thank, thanks, Bob. And, uh, uh, and thanks to everyone for the questions on the chat box. I've also gotten a couple directly. And let me try to organize them a bit for you, Bill and Terry, to really try to get through as many of those questions as possible. One really good comment came through, which I think really addresses what you all have managed to do, which is, you know, changing the behaviors, changing the mindset is the single hardest thing in terms of dealing with health and in terms of engagement. And you've kind of, with the mask and with your organization, managed to give a tool that in and of itself 
requires that kind of change, that kind of action. A couple of follow-up questions for you. One is, um, uh, let me give you three so that you could address. One is for religious communities, how did you specifically engage them in terms of either modeling or making it uh, acceptable and appropriate and, and, and needy uh, to have the masks? Um, the second is for more vulnerable populations in terms of retail and other kinds of workers where the health disparities that have been talked about may be more prevalent, the issues may be stronger. How did you assure that the masks and the acceptability of the masks got there? And then as you know, I'm an economist and somebody uh, in the chat uh, used, I think exactly the important phrase, any unintended consequences, positive <laughs> or negative, that occurred that you want to share as either an advisory or a shout out? Um, so that was a compound question, uh, but if you could you know, address those features, that would be great. You want to take that on, Terry? Okay, I'll, I'll get started. So, um, so, um, I would say this idea that all of this was being done with the uh, feelings of mutuality and respect was a key from the beginning. So when you're engaging the faith community, this was, we believe one of the most practical things we can do besides the meals that are being delivered to distressed parts of the city is to deliver a mask to everyone in our community. And we, you're not obligated to participate, but we want to know if you would like to. We want to know if you would, your original question was around the faith community. And so that minister's conference was key, other groups. And I'm, this is where, um, and, you know, Chuck and his team, and oh, I, one other thing, they, because um, this is, the balance in this is, is important. They set up like a Google form overnight and said, if you have interest in participation, go onto this form and enter it. Then every single one of those, it was hundreds and hundreds of phone calls back to them to talk about what it is, what it isn't, and now do you still want to participate? So that was key in getting good clarity. So this was not, you know, just treating people like a number. Again, it was relationally driven to answer those questions. I think that was big on how the acceptability part on what you were talking about. Um, again, it was not mandated. This was not like the mayor says everyone messed. This was a movement. And I think because it went quickly to leaders in the faith community, employers, you now had all of those leaders. If people look to someone else they respect, which actually is one of the, uh, if you look back, back at the old, uh, Everett Rogers' work on uh, adoption, diffusion and adoption, there are uh, a lot of people will adopt more quickly when they know somebody they respect has already made the decision to adopt. And I think that really played out here. Um, yeah, and and I think, say? yeah, I think, um, you know, this, this, this all kind of came up really right on the heels of the lockdown and, and, you know, everyone stay inside and the wolves are circling and it's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible. And so everybody's afraid and they don't know what to do, right? And, and I wanna do something, but I don't know what to do. And, and so I think in many ways, this idea of masking the city, that this is a helpful thing. And at that same time, there was beginning to be more discussion among healthcare people or the CDC, um, building toward ultimately a recommendation of that. But, and I think people were able to say, this is actually something we can do and this will be helpful and this will be good. And maybe, maybe back in the mind of everyone is, gosh, could this like help us get back to some sort of new normal? I mean, I think, if, though I never had this explicit conversation, I think employers were interested because they thought, oh my gosh, could this just help us move from total shutdown to some other place? And it was a need because masks were in this incredible shortage. And I think the same was true for the faith community. Can this help us restore some sense of engagement that we are missing and gathering? And while the rules had still been the same in terms of social distancing and, and the number of people who get together in public, it still was a rallying cry that everyone could identify with, everyone could get behind. And, and so in reality, it really wasn't that difficult to engage and enlist all the religious communities, 
even, you know, people you were saying, the restaurant retailer, the vulnerable folks who have lost work, everybody's in. I mean, it was, it was an amazing yeah. thing. I think I told my wife, I was like, man, the Red Sea parted. We've gotten no one who has said no. And, and again, that was also some of those first three days, calls were made to the Hindu temple, mosques, uh, neighborhood associations. There are neighborhoods that have a large political power in this community. All of those leaders were called. I, I think, I don't know how uh, Chuck and a small group of people organized okay. that, but they were very intentional to go to all of those entities virtually simultaneously so that it didn't feel like one group was being left out or that it was somebody's initiative and not somebody else's. It was, it was all at, at once. So it was this amazing unifier too. I mean, there are lots of stories of people from uh, very polarized spectrums, you know, coming together for the common good to say, yeah, we'll help unload that truck and we'll help deliver. People that ordinarily have nothing that binds them together in a common tie and this was part of that, you know, riding along on a fabric that Terry described, but now with a, a unified mission on what we were trying to accomplish. And so it was very mission oriented, very mission oriented. A, a follow up question and, and a couple of different themes have come through is that um, what a couple of thoughts specifically for how you got to where you are is uh, if those on the call or others are thinking of replicating what you've done and really trying whether it's with the same a mask the city initiative or another kind of ish, uh, of initiative you know uh, the first question that we that came up on the chat box is is 29 days too long of a period of time to address COVID-19 and for containment. So one way to, to kind of broaden that is, what's your thought as to how to set out uh, a timeline that is reasonable for the goal and that has the urgency? And given that you both are from a healthcare organization, do you have any specific do's and don'ts? Uh, in your, as you think back on how you did this, uh, that you would want to share? So I'll address the first question first. So the first two weeks of that timeline have been truncated for the benefit of others, because there are masks now available at scale. I mean, remember the first part was about innovating a mask, sorting through fabrics, figuring out we didn't want it to be made out of the typical cotton, you know, all uh, trying sizes, realizing there's multiple head shapes. How do we get something that tailors? I mean, I don't know if people know, but N95 masks actually don't fit all face types. Um, and so that work, Bill Satterwhite and his team have now done, or you, people could get the masks. But it's all, you know, getting something that's washable, uh, reusable was key. We knew we couldn't be saying, handing out disposable. So that work has now been done, whether you get it from this source or another one. I think people could do this, and if they were motivated, they could do it in less than two weeks. But the key, I think, would still be a cause where you're wishing, where you desire for no single entity to get the credit, and and everyone you're you're going to the the top of those leadership groups and asking for participation, and 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 letting them know others that are committing, and 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 so there is a ideal pace of change. That was kind of my original training uh, years ago, and there you can go too fast or too slow. And uh, I think in the case, because we had to do the manufacturing on the front end, it would have been hard to do it much faster than we did it. But I think people could do it in less than two weeks now if they were highly organized. You'll need to use on online forms to collect people's interest and have a call team that has the right kind of heart and how they're doing it. Um, let's see, and, what was the other part? And you have to identify what are the nodes of strength and leadership within the community. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be there. So sometimes we think, no, it's just the chamber for business, or it's just the hospital for healthcare, or it's just, you know, this particular organization in a neighborhood or nonprofit, but it's really much broader than that. And so the question is, you know, what are the nodes of leadership within any context and forum, and how do you get those people to say, yeah, that'd be a really good idea, and, and then you can run. Right, so Terry's right on the timeline. Really half of the 29 days is us starting with an idea, we should make a mask, to getting to you know, a place where we had designed one that could be made. And then the next chunk was really about the aligning people behind it and then how are we gonna do it. 
And so I think, I think it helps to have, you know, a burning platform mission, a real cause that matters that everyone can get behind. And then finding out what are those nodes of strength and how do we include everyone? I mean, you know, part of me at the beginning had that feeling like, if we can't do it for everyone, then let's just not do it. You know, we really need everyone to be in, and we've all got to be in, and we're going to be willing to do whatever it takes to make it work. Yeah, I think the other, um, on the unintended consequence side, or, oh, yeah. or, or good question. the, you know, the, the, the good part was a number of people found out they were, where they were suddenly about to be working alongside, delivering with, you know, putting boxes of masks. I mean, by the way, 390 or 60, 70,000 masks takes up like multiple rooms. So, you know, you've got, <laughs> you've actually got forklifts involved and, and multiple trucks. It's, it's a lot of volume. So people were working beside each other. And the good was they're building a relationship and saying things like, you know what, I've been wanting to meet uh, someone from your organization. It took some nudging to encourage people to do that, but to also, you know, stay to this goal. The complexity now, and I, I, I think Chuck would say, is the, you know, asset mapping is a common technique in a number of cities. And you can end up in doing that for a long, long time. There's now some asset mapping insights that are pretty deep that they're working to digitize and to share with other leaders so that other positive change can ride on the back of what's been learned in this, uh, this big wave. And so it's not really an unintended, uh, the biggest unintended consequence is if everyone would have run outside, which we, we you know, and, and, and ignore the re request for social I isolating. We, we, we anticipated that one early. And the other one might have been, if, you know, if people actually didn't want to work together or something, but that was navigated through good relational skills. So I, I don't think other than the fact we, you know, some people got physically tired and we've encouraged them. I know Chuck had to tell people, hey, you have got to take a day off from <laughs> delivering meals. These are people that are so committed um, so that they're not completely exhausted. So that, you know, that's something to be managed. The other thing I'll say unintended consequences were um, for our particular Massive City Initiative, we were moving so quickly that we did not do a good job uh, really at our press conference or, or right thereafter at saying, this is how they are going to be paced out. I think we left the impression at the end of the press conference that we had, you know, hundreds of thousands of masks sitting right behind us and you just come get them, right? And, and we hadn't really laid out the fact that that was going to be a rolling process of, you know, production and delivery and distribution uh, and so initially people were like, well, where are they? You just announced it. Like, where are they? And we'd be like, well, they made 10,000 yesterday. We're handing them out. They're going to make 20,000 today. And, and so we, we didn't do a good job of that, mostly because of the speed at which we were moving. And so that would be one unintended consequence. I think some people felt like, hey, you forgot me. I don't have a mask, you know. The other was uh, knowing probably now if I were doing it again or helping another city, I would say, you've got to have a large number in reserve for people that actually don't fit into all these other organizations and groups or neighborhoods or whatever it is, because they're going to be there and you just don't know it yet. And, and so you've got to then be able to respond. Yeah. I was on, I was on a call this morning that a, a group just returned some masks and they said, great uh, to love out loud. Cause we have some other people that said they would like them. So yeah, there, that, yeah, there's that. And then I would say on the positive side, the, another unintended consequences was just, it created this great sense of unity in the community and that now that now is continuing to play out as beneficial assets. Um, at least for my ears, I have not heard of really much negative unintended consequence. It might be out there and it just hadn't made it to me, but I, I really haven't heard any. To, to ask, and I think you've just given some great guidance on accountability and, and management of it and thoughts for other cities or other organizations on this call that may be thinking about replicating this specific one or another initiative. As you're going forward, you know, a couple of other critical questions that have come up on the chat are, you know, there's, the, this pandemic has really, as Bob emphasized and I did, emphasize some of the fault lines, some of the access issues, and that we've got you know, multiple waves or issues that we're gonna be looking at. One of the most critical ones is not only the health impact of COVID-19 on exposing in terms of social determinants and conditions, 
uh, but also in terms of the economic impact going forward. Uh, what's your sense of the kinds, and, and a related question is how can healthcare providers, particularly primary care, really start to engage with the business communities such as the ones you've activated in Mask the City to move forward more on addressing those kinds of issues. Do you see that as a role for yourself, something you can facilitate? Oh, yeah. Um, that would yeah, be yeah. to address. Yeah, absolutely. And and so part 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 of Terry's and my you know understanding really of people in society today is this. Most people have two places of social connection these days. One is home, one is work. Those are the strongest social connections most people have. Uh, compared to my parents' generation, they were born in the 30s. You know, they belong to clubs and, and organizations and all these things and stay members for life. People don't do that so much anymore. And the primary places of connection are home and work and church. Yeah, and some is church, but that, there's a lot of variability on yeah, that. Religious not, organizations not go there. Right. right. But not like they were, you know, say, for my parents in the 50s, 60s. Um, and so, so part of our job in healthcare is to say, how do we recognize where people are, where are places of meaning, and let's go there, right? If you actually want people to get well and better, you got to go to where they are. You got to make it convenient. You got to try to have it be as cost free as possible. Not that someone's not paying for it, but just no barriers for the people to engage and and so that's a tricky thing for healthcare because uh, mostly we sit there and say we're the experts come to us here's the box i want you to come to and here are the times i want you to come oh and by the way here's what we'll do for you and you may say well that's not exactly what i wanted well that's too bad that's actually what we're doing you know this is what we're selling and you have to buy it and so by going directly to employers and the people there it creates a whole new opportunity because um a lot of the things around equity and transportation and other things sort of dissipate because you're now in a context of connection already and you're just plugging into that and saying, what services can I take to you there? I think the other thought is a positive byproduct of COVID is the speed with which virtual healthcare at scale has been put in place. So I'll tell you in our own health system, so we have several thousand, a couple thousand physicians, in the course of a week, 850 physicians that had not been trained on virtual visits were trained and began them. And so eight, and that's multiple specialties. So the fact you're talking, your question, uh, part of it was about reaching the underserved and underserved parts of the community. Part of what the benefit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an unintended benefit of COVID is you now have at scale a lot more providers who are built for, now I realize not every visit can be replaced by virtual, but a number of them can, and you now have a lot of uh, people and specialties that can deliver that. And I realize there are some cases where uh, in underserved communities, they don't have access to high-speed internet, uh, but of course it doesn't have to be video, it can be audio, and, and, I, and, and most community centers could be a place if they had to. So I think that's a new benefit that we're gonna see pervasive access. Uh, one of the things we're highly involved in, I'm highly involved in, is population health. We have lots of people working in distressed communities, bringing care directly to people. And I only anticipate that that will be enhanced over the next, you know, the next year as by layering on heavy or virtual on top of what's being done. And I don't think we can underestimate the economic impact. That was another thing you mentioned, that's huge. And uh, you know, uh, in 2016, some of y'all may have seen this, Federal Reserve put out a report that said 44% of Americans do not have $400 in a savings account to draw on if they have an emergency. Well, uh, that's essentially half of the country doesn't have any economic resource or cushion at all. So when you say one, two, three, everyone stop working for a whole month, they're all in deep trouble, right, instantly. And so the economic impact is huge. And I know within our own community, we've been, um, emphasizing in this context the importance of mask and distancing and health care and all of that. But at the same time, we've also been saying, look, uh, you know, we've got to figure out what is the new normal of reengaging in life in a COVID-19 era? What does that look like and what does it take? We don't want to say, hey, you know, no one in my family died of COVID-19, but they all died of starvation and no assets, right? And other conditions that were allowed to explode because they wouldn't leave the house. And so 
we've got to balance all that out and say, what are the appropriate steps? And we happen to have a community that um, is a good size for us to be able to say, when do we sort of let more happen? Oh, maybe we need to dial it down. Maybe we need to dial it up. And, and so that's part of the mindset that we have is how do we re-engage in life? I mean, many, many, many people have had devastating impact from the fact that they've now gone two months with virtually no work. Thank you. And, and I think maybe I want to flag to people's attention, I think on the economic impact side, I do want to just flag for people's attention, uh, George's, uh, Isham's question about if anyone is aware of estimates of what Bill was just speaking about too, in terms of what the health impact is going to be that's going to result from the economic uh, mm -hmm. impact that's there. So if anyone has that, if they could share that. We have a couple of minutes left and wanted to give Bill and Terry you the option to, to just kind of, you know, share, have the last word. Um, and to echo to everyone on the call, Bob's invitation that if you uh, have case examples that you want to share, uh, please do so. We'll make a mechanism. But Bill and Terry, the last uh, two minutes are yours. All right, so my, I'll let Terry sum it all up at the end. My, my one minute will be, um, I want to encourage everyone to take on things like this. I will also say every community is different. You'll have to figure out how does your community work and, and what are the ways that you can come together to get, you know, something meaningful done. I want to encourage you and say it's possible. You know, we have a lot more resources than we think if we, if we bind together and try to, try to do it. If we're all pulling in different directions, it's not going anywhere. So I want to encourage you in that sense. We would love to hear about things that you are doing either in the community initiative front, in employers, what are the things that you have encountered? And, um, you know, wish we could somehow engage in a in a face-to-face -face conversation with everybody about it, because we would love to talk all day on it, actually. I think my minute's up, it's Terry's turn. Well, that was a great summary. I think the couple things I would say in addition is, so the, you know, we've all heard on the news of a, a, a lot of stories of heroic work by healthcare workers. And that's all very valid. And we have those same stories, um, you know, and, and powerful stories in our own healthcare organization. But I think what I want to point out is there's lots of heroic work happening. Uh, I know in this community with, you know, dozens and hundreds of people that are, you know, mobilizing meals, mobilizing educational materials to people's houses, mobilizing supplies, um, you know, there's something called blessing bags, just surprising people on some something to brighten their day and provide some very practical things that they need. And I think that allows in their own way for us as individuals to be, you know, heroes or people taking action in the face of uncertainty and some level of risk. And in the end, we'll make our community better. And I know I was uh, actually talking to uh, my son. Uh, who had a college student uh, roommate of his in another state that would not let him, would, did not want him to leave the apartment because he was so fearful. And I said, uh, I told my son, um, tell him if you're comfortable that at the end of your life, when you look back on the things that you've accomplished, are you going to look back on this six months or one year period and not actually have something to point to where you've made a difference and made someone's life better, even though there were was replete opportunity, or are you gonna take this opportunity to do something to make others' lives better? And I think we all have that opportunity. Most of us on the phone are probably leaders, and so we have the opportunity to think about it at larger scale and catalyze others into that level of service for uh, others. But I, I, I really think this crisis, which is real, it is severe, it is painful. It is also an opportunity for us to do amazing things as individuals and or organizations for others. And so I encourage you on your journey to do that. Super. Terry, thank you. On behalf of the Academy staff, uh, uh, my co-chairs, Bob and Michelle, uh, thank you for making a difference and for sharing your experience with us. We'll go out and do the same. Wonderful. Mask up, y'all. Mask up. Thank you. A pleasure. See you later. Good job, Meg. <laughs> <laughs>